All right. What's up, folks? Howdy there. Happy Tuesday. Is it Tuesday? It is Tuesday. Uh, I wanted to do uh, a little different. And the whole world has just been caught up on the, the coronavirus here lately. So I kind of wanted to do something a little different. And uh, as we were, I was talking the other day with, uh, with Corb, and you guys know, been listening for very long. I'm a pretty big history nerd. And uh, one, of the, one of the areas that, really, that I'm really interested in is uh, the Western frontier, Old West history, um, you know, from like uh, Reconstruction somewhere around there, even before the Civil War, all the way up to about the turn of the 19th century, uh, 20th century. So uh, that's always been a kind of a, a big, um, big area where I, I like I really nerd out and um so I wanted to kind of try something a little different today we'll see how you guys like it um but we're gonna talk about a little tragic tale a little bit of uh I should probably get my historical background up since uh you know since it's a history show now uh but this uh this took place pretty close to where I grew up. There we go. And, uh, and I've heard this story many times throughout the years. Um, and the guy that, um, that I'll talk about here was pretty famous back in the day, but he wasn't very well known as far as, uh, as modern day stuff goes, because he was kind of the, really kind of the end of the, the old west uh, outlaw type. Uh, there really wasn't Anything else, um, you know, I guess it'd be this, this guy's gang and like the, the wild bunch, the hole in the wall gang, um, were kind of the end of the, the old west. And when they, when they uh, went by the wayside, I guess, you know, the west was officially kind of settled, you know, that along with uh, when the last, last the Indian tribes uh, went to the reservation. You know, that was, that was kind of the settle, settlement of the west and that was it, so. Um, Anyhow, this guy was pretty famous at the time. Uh, he's not so much anymore, but it's a really, really interesting story. So I think you'll like it. But before we get to that, you know, we've got sponsors, got to pay for this whole whole thing to, uh, to keep plugging along and uh, making it better. So uh, let me first tell you about Loma Livestock. You know these guys very well. You know, George, he's been on the show uh, several times now, and uh, we're We'll uh, hear from him later this week on uh, for another market report. But in the meantime, uh, tomorrow, got a sale there at Loma, Colorado. They're located at 1369 12 and a half Road. Cows and singles start at 10 o'clock, followed by the feeders and the larger bunches at 11. And uh, you can give them a holler if you'd like to consign or you got any questions for them, 970-858-9988. Or you can check them out online at lomalivestock.com. And next up, we've got uh, Mr. Nick Allen Loot with his rawhide braiding uh, services. Um, he is, specializes in braided rawhide Hondas. Uh, he's got a, a, what he calls a burning daylight special. So it's got the, the braided Honda and then there's like a neck to it. He also makes San Joaquin styles, uh, but they're all hand braided. They're tougher than nails. They add some weight to your rope. So even on a, you know, a little lightweight nylon, you can still go out in the wind and, and, and throw a loop. And uh, also they uh, got a lot of speed to them. So uh, you can check him out on Facebook, uh, Nick Allen Lute, L-U-T-E, or uh, at Will Cowboy for Food on Instagram. And that's all one word, uh, uh, F-O-R instead of the number four, Will Cowboy for Food. And uh, check him out. Make sure you tell him uh, Burning Daylight sent you. He'll cut you a little discount. And uh, thanks to George. Thanks to Nick. And uh, let's get into this. Um, I'm going to tell you a story about a guy named Thomas Edward Ketchum. He was born in <coughs> San Saba County, Texas. Uh, and he died at the age of 37 in a little place called Clayton, New Mexico. Just about an hour from where I grew up, and uh, he is 
he is very famous because uh, he is um, not only is he the kind of the one of the last true train robbers of the the old west, but he also died in a particularly gruesome way. So uh, I'll read you a quote from Sheriff Garcia, who was the the sheriff of Union County, is where Clayton is, and. Uh, what time, I forget what time of day it said he, but it was uh, April 26, 1901. And this was a pretty significant deal because he was a uh, well-known uh, train robber, robbed several trains, uh, kind of all around a bad dude. Um, second of all, he was the first person to ever be hung in Union County, New Mexico. And, uh, Third of all, even though he was, uh, he had admitted to killing several people, he was never convicted. So he was not being hung for murder. He was actually being hung for the first time ever uh, for attempting to, tra- to rob a train. And uh, at the time, New Mexico was still a territory, not a state. And uh, they had passed this law because of uh, groups like the Ketchum Gang and uh, and some other bandits that are around the, the area had uh, taken to robbing these trains because a lot of a uh, lot of companies used them to carry their bankroll uh, out to the west coast and uh, you know just deposits and shit back and forth from like St. Louis all the way up to uh, over to San Francisco and so they hit these trains that they'd, they'd make off the loot sometimes they'd kill passengers most of the time not and uh, and they always. Uh, you know, even the good ones had some had some really shitty moments, and we'll talk about one of those uh, here in just a little bit. But they passed this law to really try to make an example out of uh, some of these people when they caught them. So it made it a capital offense to uh, attempt to rob a train, and that is what uh, Thomas Ketchum was eventually convicted of. And um, so he was the first person to be sentenced to death for attempting to rob a train. He was the first person and the only person in New Mexico territory that uh, actually was executed for attempting to rob a train. That law was later overturned by the Supreme Court, uh, pretty ironically. And, uh, but that was, uh, it was far too late for, for old Tom Ketchum. So, um, if, if you guys have heard this story before, you're catching on that this is uh, a guy known as Blackjack Ketchum. And a uh, funny story about that is, I believe it was during one of his uh, train robberies or um, I don't know if it was a stagecoach maybe, but they're robbing something. It's kind of kind of his deal was just rob. Uh, somebody had uh, mistaken him for a guy named Bra- Blackjack Christian. And, uh, and then from there on, the name Blackjack kind of stuck. And I, I don't know what the meaning was behind it. I don't know why this, uh, this Blackjack Christian was named that. Um, I'm guessing he was either a, a really good Blackjack player or, uh, you know, something of the sort. But I'd like to think that the, the Ketchum gang, um, that this original Blackjack guy was kind of a kind of an inf- effeminate little character uh you know back when we could use these words uh he was he was kind of a queer and uh they just made fun of him because uh he got mistaken for for a gay that was a uh, guy that was possibly gay and uh that's why uh he took the name blackjack but then he has to own it because he's a tough guy uh that is 100 percent speculation um, but if you speculate hard enough, it makes it fact. Just ask uh, any of the news media. Um, but so that's what I'm going with. <clears throat> but that, that was why he got his nickname. And um, this guy was actually, when he was hung, was decapitated. And uh, so there's a whole story behind that, too. And we'll get to all that. So uh, to, to set the stage, though, about how we get to old Thomas Ketchum, old Tommy Boy, I uh, go back a ways, and uh, his family was uh, one of the early pioneers over to Texas. Uh, they moved in 
1849, um, his grandpa, Tom's, Thomas uh, Ketchum's grandpa, Peter, they moved from Illinois to Caldwell County, Texas. And his oldest son was a guy named Green Berry. <clears throat> and Berry is spelled like a strawberry. So Green Berry uh, Ketchum, which was uh, Thomas's dad. And uh, they, they moved to Caldwell County, Texas, and, and settled there. And then they, uh, they moved over to San Saba County, Texas, where they had uh, Greenberry Jr., uh, Sam, Samuel uh, Ketchum, and then uh, Thomas was the youngest, Blackjack. And uh, this article I was reading, they say in 1867, well, in 1860, Greenberry, which was Pete's oldest son, Blackjack's dad, they acquired a personal property worth about $4,500, which back in those days was a, a hell of a lot of money. So they were, uh, they were doing pretty well. And so they, they bought this spread out in, uh, in San Saba County. And uh, they had two girls that uh, their first kid was a, was a girl. Then they had, then they had the two boys, uh, Greenberry and Sam. And then they had another daughter and then, oh, okay, there's, uh, so then, uh, then James, which was another brother. And then uh, the, the youngest was, was Blackjack. So uh in 1863 is when uh, blackjack was born in 1867 uh his brother james and another one of their family doesn't say who were murdered by a band of kickapoo indian raiders and then in uh 1860 1868 uh greenberry senior the the granddad died and uh, at the time, you know, it's uh, the family estate basically goes to the, the young or the oldest boy, and then it gets divided up, you know, kind of proportionally uh, down the line. But the, the youngest typically doesn't end up with much. And that was the case for old Blackjack. And uh, apparently he was pretty sour about it uh, the whole time. So Green Barry, who he went by Barry, it says, um, he... He kind of took over the ranch and they ended up moving to Tom Green County, Texas, I think is what the Tom Green. Yeah, Tom Green County. And uh, and Sam and and uh, Blackjack, they followed him over there. And it says that um, Blackjack Ketchum was always kind of sour at his oldest brother because uh, being the, being the oldest surviving kin. Uh, male kin, he got basically the whole ranch, and uh, Sam and, and Tommy Boy, they didn't get a whole lot, and he always thought that uh, that his older brother Barry had kind of treated him more like a servant or just an employee rather than, you know, a uh, kinfolk or a brother, so he always kind of resented that, and, um, but anyway, they, they head over to Tom Green County, and at this point, um, apparently they fell fall on some hard times, and the, uh, their operation was about it was less than half the value it was when they bought it in 1860. So, and this was 1873 is when when uh, Barry Jr. he when he took over, and and so they lost about half the value. Uh, but there was also um, they were also on the losing side of a civil war in that meantime. So that could make up, uh, make up a pretty good reason as to why the, their place wasn't worth a whole hell of a lot. Um, so needless to say, it was kind of hard to support the whole family on that, that operation. And, uh, Sam and, and Tom, they, they go off kind of on their own. Uh, Sam was kind of, um, they called him like a minute man. Yeah, I guess it was Minuteman was their their outfit, and they were kind of like um, volunteer Texas Rangers, kind of, but not like hardcore Rangers. They're 
it's more like a national guard, I guess, <clears throat> for, you know, to protect against bandits. They were the, they were the captain call after he retired, um, you know, protect against bandits and Indians and, and all that. But so Sam, he goes and, and does that. And I guess he had pretty, pretty good uh, service record and he comes back, he gets married, has a, has a boy, has a girl, uh, but apparently the marriage didn't work out and he, uh, his wife left him or he left the wife and he ends up, uh, he ends up going crashing with his sister. Um, and then Tom was stuck at home with, with Barry and then their relationship was just kind of, kind of getting worse. And then, uh, in 1880 is when old Blackjack first kind of fell, uh, crossways with the law and he was uh he was summoned for contempt of court uh because um he failed to appear as a witness in an earlier case it doesn't really say what the what the case he was supposed to testify in but he he just didn't show up so they issued a warrant and um he they uh they went ahead and they moved. I guess that was when they moved to Tom Green County. And and Tom went with them, but he was uh, you know, he just sour about the whole deal. And then uh in eighty five uh is when Sam and Tom took to Cowboys. They were kinda in the early days of uh well, I guess not really early days, but kind of the heyday of uh of the cattle barons. And so older brother, Barry, he's, he's there in Tom Green County trying to make some more, uh, make more of himself. And, uh, Sam and Tom, they, uh, they go off and they go cowboy. And apparently they, they cowboyed all over, uh, West Texas there in Eastern New Mexico and over into Arizona quite a bit. Um, but then, they uh sorry about that um they had a new sheriff in tom green county and the first guy he arrested was was black jack ketchum and his uh, what he had done was chased a dog into a church and then down the aisle while uh, while they were holding sunday service and uh and so this new sheriff he gets elected and the first person he he arrests is old blackjack and uh and his uh his oldest brother really really got on to him pretty hard for this but it turns out that um he also had his eye on the, the sheriff's oldest daughter and he actually later married that that old gal and um so that just kind of further pushed uh old blackjack away and he so he then kind of took off and um with with his brother Sam and they they just went off punching cows and uh and raising hell but they they were both apparently really uh for the time very big fellas uh and really I guess known to be pretty pretty good looking guys and um it says here that uh that blackjack Ketchum was five foot eleven so the average height at around the turn of the century was five foot five. So he's a half head taller than than the average guy and weighed about a buck ninety. And this is uh you know, we're we're talking West Texas in the in the late eighteen hundreds, right around the turn of the century, punching cows, you know, still a lot of big open country then. And uh and you know, even if you can go to town, you you might be able to get some some uh like salted meat and uh dry goods, but you know, you're basically, yeah, you're, you're living off the land out there. So this guy was probably pretty lean, uh, still, still packing in a, at a buck, buck 90, you know, so pretty, pretty solid fellow. He was known to be pretty good with the ladies. Uh, he, did, he never really stayed anywhere very long. Um, and apparently he was a really good shot. So he, um, him and Sam, they took up with this fella named david atkins and uh, and th this guy later on uh 
after him and Sam got busted robbing a train, he said that uh, that Thomas Ketchum was a very brutal man. And so he was, uh, you know, pretty tall guy, big stout, dark skin, had a great big black mustache, uh, you know, and, and pretty good looking guy. So his brother Sam was kind of light skinned and uh, almost a ginger, more of a day walker. Um, he wasn't quite as tall as Tom, but he was, uh, he was just almost as tall and was also supposed to be, you know, pretty, pretty good specimen of a man. And so obviously back in those days, there's, uh, you know, when you come to town, there might be like six people that live there. And, uh, if they've got a whole, uh, you know, if that family of, of six has like three girls that they need to get married off, they're going to push them off on just about anybody. And, uh, and these two guys being, uh, you know, a couple of hunks, they, they probably did very well back in the, in the Old West days. Um, once again, that is 100% speculation on my part, but there we go. Um, but they, they kind of bounced around. They, they, they worked for several different big outfits. They, they robbed stores and post offices and shit here and there. Um, but they you know, they were never really, um, and never really fit in anywhere. And they didn't really start, uh, they didn't really start going off the rails until it was, uh, son of a bitch lost my place. Uh, it was like 1895. Okay, so before they, they started robbing trains, uh, 1892 is, they, they robbed the uh, Atchison, Topeka, and Santa Fe that was on its way to Deming with, uh, with a huge payroll. And so they, they set up their ambush outside of a place called Nut, N-U-T-T, New Mexico, which was uh, a water station so just uh you know had a water tower and those steam engines would <laughs> leather bound books it is mahogany brett stanley it is uh and so they they stop at this water station they and they set up their out their ambush and uh so as they they come in the to get water to refill the boiler they they hop on hold the conductor and the engineer up at gunpoint and at that point, they didn't do uh, they didn't do anything except uh, you know blow the safes right there, and they made off with about twenty grand. And uh, but somehow, when they were setting the charges or whatever, the conductor got away, and um, and they they sent out a telegraph. Posse was on the way, and uh, by the time they they got there though the the whole gang had split up they uh they found their they found a safe house they hold up there and then uh blackjack he he heads over into arizona and uh it says the the loot that they got 20 grand was was never recovered so they probably spent it gambled it off and um and then in 1895 um a neighbor of, uh, of the older brother, Barry, back in Tom Green County, a guy named John Jap Powers. I don't know why he got the name Jap that early on in, uh, in you know, the late 18, 1800s. I would venture to bet most Americans didn't even know Japan existed, so I doubt this guy was, was a Japanese fella, but Anyway, his, his nickname was Jap for some reason. And apparently he had had some beef with uh, older brother Barry, but um, nothing too terrible. But he, he was also an unliked by a bunch of the other neighbors. And he got killed some uh, by Tom and some other guys. Um, he was never really, uh, he was never really a, uh, a suspect in that murder but he later admitted uh to do it said he was paid to do so but you know after this guy got killed uh tom and sam they they hauled ass back over the line to new mexico and um 
and they, they stayed in there for a while. They always showed up at the dances uh, with uh, really nice horses, uh, threw around a bunch of money. They were very polite. And um, they, they said they were cowboys, but they, they all, you know, they, they dressed to the nines. They, they were just showing out. And um, they, uh, they worked at the Bell Ranch. And then they, um, then they quit and they stole a bunch of supplies and shit. And then, um, then they showed up in uh, Liberty, New Mexico, which is uh, over by Tucumcari. And they robbed a, a store and a post office. And then uh, they, they hauled ass and actually I guess the guy that uh, owned the store that they robbed um, led the posse chasing after him. And uh, they got to the Pecos River and uh, they had a shootout, and uh, most of the posse guys got killed. And then they headed back into Arizona, and uh, apparently they, they met, met up with Butch Cassidy and, uh, and the Wild Bunch over there from time to time. But they, uh, they, they felt pretty good about, about robbing trains there in, uh, in northeast New Mexico, and in between... Uh, right here it says between Folsom and Des Moines, which if you know that area, it is, there is nothing out there, just canyons. And they, uh, there was a, uh, it was kind of crosses the, the old Santa Fe trail there. And so what they would do is they'd, they'd stop a train and, uh, and they'd, they'd make, they set a red light signal. I'm not sure how they did that back then. Or they would uh, they would set fire on make a big bonfire on either side of the track, uh, cause the conductor to slow down and stop because it looked like the the track was on fire. And then what they'd do was they would uh, they'd unhook the mail and the express cars, and they would uh, move them about half a mile down the track uh, where they had left a bunch of explosives and shit. And then they would. Uh, they would blow the safes right there and then they'd, uh, you know, then they'd head for the hills, either bury the, the stuff or, you know, they'd, they'd find a safe house and, and lay low. But typically they just, uh, they'd take a little bit of the, the cash and then they'd split ways and then they'd just go, go meander for a while. And then they'd come back and they, and they got on these and right in the same area the whole time. So, that first time in, uh, when, well, I guess it had been 1897, it says, they, they made off with about 20 grand in gold and 40 grand in silver. So, you know, it's a, it's a pretty good chunk of change today, but that's a shitload of money back then. And um, they lived in a cave south of Folsom uh, for a day, and then they, you know, they took off. And then... In 1899, they they did it again, but this time Blackjack was not there, and they uh, they were over by Dry Canyon, uh, New Mexico, and Sam and a couple buddies they made off with 50 grand, and then they uh, they had a posse chase them over to a place. Uh, over by Cimarron, New Mexico, which is where, uh, right around there, where R.W. Hampton lives now. But the, these, you know, Sam Ketchum and his buddies, they were, uh, of course, they had a, a shitload of money because they'd been robbing trains, so they had all the best stuff. And uh, so they, they pretty well uh, gave these, gave the posse hell from this this hideout but they both got a uh, shot and they both got captured at least uh sam ketchum and uh elza lay is the guy's name or also known as uh william mcginnis and um but they they got captured but uh but the posse they killed the sheriff and uh and another posse guy, and then injured another. Uh, but they, 
you know, they got Sam Ketchum, they got Willie McGinnis, and uh, they're taking to to hold trial, but Sam got Gang Green in his arm, so he got he got shot like right above the elbow, must have shattered the bone, and they, they went to amputate his arm, but it was already uh, already had the Gang Green, and he died before he could uh, serve out his sentence. Or it, I don't think he was ever even convicted. And then the other guy, Willie, he was arrested and he was convicted for murder and sentenced to life in prison. And then uh, one of the other guys, he, uh, he escaped that, that hold up there and then he ended up meeting back up with a wild bunch. So in the meantime, uh, I guess before that, Sam and, uh, and Blackjack had, uh, had kind of come to blows over something. Um, Blackjack, the more money they got, the more trains they robbed, the more it got to his head, and the more violent his temper got, and the more he drank, and he is just kind of just become a regular old fuckhead. And um, and Sam said, uh, you know, piss on you, we're doing our own thing. And um, I guess this had happened a couple times before, but um, Blackjack had told uh, later on when he got captured, he told him that he was on his way to men fences with Sam and they were going to rob this train. But, you know, being back in, uh, you know, 1900, 1901, they didn't have social media. And uh, he, he didn't know that they had already uh, robbed a train. So he, um, he gets to their, their normal meeting spot. And uh, they don't show uh, they usually, I don't know how they did it. They check in, you know, every couple of weeks or something like that. But anyhow, he, he figured out they weren't there, but he didn't know that they had, you know, robbed a train, made off with a bunch of money and then got captured by a posse. So he, uh, he decided, well, piss on it. I'm just going to rob this train myself, which is, you know, pretty ballsy move. Got to respect him for that. Maybe not the smartest move, but ballsy. Um, even worse off for old Blackjack's luck, though, the conductor on this train he was about to rob, his name was Frank Harrington. And this was the third time he had been robbed, held up and robbed. And I'm sure he'd been roughed up the first couple times. <clears throat> and um, I imagine not only was he worried for his life, but he's probably worried for his job because I don't know how many times they let you uh, get your train robbed and looted uh before they just fire your ass so i don't know how that worked but this was his third time and he wasn't having it anymore this time and uh he, he brought a shotgun with him but anyhow they um they did the old fire trick set a bonfire on both both sides and uh he got him to pull over blackjack he hops in holds the conductor at a, a gunpoint and uh he had him pull up ahead to where he had, uh, where he was going to uncouple these cars. The, the hell of it was that this, uh, this particular railroad line, the Atch Atchison, Topeka, and Santa Fe, had an old style uh, clevis hitch on these, on these uh, rail cars. So when you were stopped on a bend in the track, <coughs> those, uh, those pins wouldn't come unlocked, and so he wouldn't wasn't going to be able to uncouple those cars. So apparently he was uh, he was giving them hell and had the had those train workers uh, just beating the shit out of the pins on these these uh, hitches, trying to get them unhooked. And uh, but they were they were in the wrong spot; wasn't going to happen. And uh, and you know he was he was cussing and and you know smacking them on the head and shit. Well, he didn't notice that the conductor had a shotgun and the dude just about sawed his fucking arm off. Blew him, blew a hole right through his elbow. And, uh, and so he, uh, he jumps off the, the, the train right there, rolls down the embankment and he makes it over to his horse, but he's just got a bloody stump for an arm. So he can't get, uh, and he's losing blood real quick and can't manage to pull himself up on his horse. So he, uh, he just knows that the posses are going to be on their way since uh, the rest of the, the crew got away. And so he just, 
hangs out right there and he just turns himself in. He said, uh, he later said, I tried a dozen times to mount my horse, but it was too weak to do it. And so he just sat down there and waited. And uh, said a man was seen about 100 yards from the train waving his hat on the end of his gun as a signal. When the train was stopped and the conductor and handbrakeman approached, Blackjack drew a gun on them. The conductor said, we just came to help you, but if this is the way you feel, we'll go ahead and leave you. And he said, no, boys, I'm all done. Take me in. And then, uh, so that's one account. There's another one where it says uh, the sheriff uh, took him in. But either way, he, uh, they put him on the, the caboose. They took him into Folsom. And uh, he, told him, uh, he told him a line of shit to start with. Um, but they figured out who he was. And he eventually, uh, they took him to uh, Trinidad uh, to get his arm amputated what was left of it. And then uh, they took him to Santa Fe. And then uh, he later went to uh, Clayton in Union County where uh, he had to stand trial. He, uh, he pled not guilty. Uh, the judge found him guilty and they sentenced him to death by hanging. So this was uh, a pretty big to do because as I mentioned before, there was, uh, there's nobody ever been hung in Union County New Mexico before or I don't think since um so this was a you know big excitement everybody was coming to watch uh, the big hanging and um they wanted to get this thing right so they delayed it a couple times and then uh there's a rumor going around that the old gang was gonna go come and uh and shoot him free um and it must have been uh rumors of like uh, it wouldn't have been his brother because his brother was dead. Um, but there, there was probably rumors that the wild bunch was going to come in guns a blazing. And so finally they decided on April 26, 1901 at eight o'clock in the morning, he was going to be hung. So, uh, you know, the, the stores were closing for it and the, the saloons would main, remain open, but just, you know, bare bones crowd. It was going to be a just a giant spectacle. And, um, but seems how that nobody had been hung in that county. Um, and most of those people had lived there for a long time. There wasn't all, there also wasn't anybody that knew how to conduct a hanging. So I imagine what ensued was about like when you, uh, walk out in the parking lot of a rodeo and you see a pickup with the hood, uh, popped. Uh, next thing you know, there's going to be about 50 cowboys, all with the Coors Light in their hand, telling you what's wrong with it, and maybe two or three of the 50 may have an idea of what they're actually talking about. Um, so something along those lines, except when they're talking about how to tie a hangman's noose, what kind of rope to use, how far you had to drop them, and I'm sure you guys know, but the the idea when you hang someone is not for them to strangle to death it's for them to drop and break their neck and then they die instantly so there's all uh there's all a bunch of math to it and um so they <laughs> you know they they had a had a big to do about it had a bunch of ideas being thrown thrown around but somehow they uh they ended up setting or they decided on a drop of seven foot nine inches. And uh, they, were, they were really worried about it because there were people coming from off to see this thing, real worried. And so the night before, they, they managed to rig up a 200 pound weight to do a test run for it. And uh, I don't know what exactly they were looking for to just make sure the, you know, that weight hit just right, I guess, and you know, just minimum amount of bounce or or what the deal was, I'm not for sure, but they uh, they tried it out, and uh, everybody was, you know, they were they thought that was just peachy, you know, perfect perfect way to go about it. So they uh, they all go off to the bar to celebrate, and the next morning at eight o'clock, they lead old Blackjack Tommy Boy Ketchum up the stairs, 
Uh, he's got, you know, just a, a arm and a half, and he's got a black hood over his head, and they've got that hood attached with a bunch of, uh, like, big um, safety pin type deals. They put the noose around his neck and everything, and uh, they drop the trap at 8.17 in the morning. And uh, next thing you know, he's sure enough, but in their celebration for getting this test go, you know, satisfactory test run on this, this hanging, they, uh, they failed to remove the 200 pound weight that they were using uh, in this test run. And they also used uh, too much of a drop. Apparently seven foot nine inches was way too much of a drop. And uh, they used too small of a diameter what the, what the diameter was, but apparently it was too small. And the combined force of all three of those things took his head right off. And uh, apparently the only thing that kept it from rolling out and in, into the street was uh, those safety pins that, that held the hood onto his head. So it was just kind of like dangling right next to his body. And uh, being in 1901, they, they had cameras pretty readily available and uh, it was widely publicized. And there was a, there's a big crowd gathered with cameras and uh, if the, the Eklund Hotel, whenever this whole quarantine is over if you're ever for some reason rolling through Clayton, New Mexico, I'd highly recommend stopping at the Eckland Hotel, having a bite to eat, having a couple drinks, and you can see the actual pictures of Blackjack Ketchum with his head laying next to his body in the, in the you know that black hood. Um, but yeah, the the first and only hanging in Union County, New Mexico. They popped his head right off and they got it on film. And uh, my, my dad and one of his buddies, uh, if you guys have been listening to the show for, you know, since the beginning, I, I think I've probably talked about it, but my dad and his buddies, they used to do a reenactment of, of the Blackjack Ketchum hanging, except they, you know, it was highly dramatized. They'd, they'd have a shootout and everything, um, but they'd put a, a watermelon on, on top of my, uh, my dad's buddy's head and he was he was standing at the gallows. They dropped the trap door, and then the watermelon would splatter everywhere. And uh, it's uh, it's one of those stories. Uh, I I think uh, for some reason it never really got the notoriety um, it deserved. But there was a there was a lot of shit going uh, that went around to it. Um, you know, from the law that was being used to prosecute him and, uh, and convict him being overturned by the Supreme Court later on. Uh, and basically that the law, that law in the first place was meant to uh, directly for that guy, uh, like for Blackjack Ketchum and, uh, and people like him, but mostly his gang because they had hit so many trains in that same part of uh new mexico that you know they uh they were really getting tired of this guy because he was he was making uh new mexico look bad and you know new mexico is still being a territory at the time they're trying to attract enough people and uh and do everything right so they can apply for statehood and uh and this band of thugs and scallywags uh robbing a bunch of fucking trains ain't helping their cause so they, they really wanted to get rid of this guy and they got rid of him in probably the most brutal way possible. Uh, man, it makes for, I don't know about you guys, but I, I think it made for a hell of a story. I, it's, it's kind of funny how far we've come since, you know, that was a hundred and 119 years ago, almost to the day we've, uh, we've come a long way. So, uh, you know, with all this, uh, quarantine, lockdown bullshit uh just remember it uh it could be worse we uh we're not living in the, the old west time so even though there's a lot of times i wish it was uh but there's still a lot of modern conveniences that uh we we kind of take for granted and uh and you don't have to worry about um getting convicted of robbing a train and getting your head popped off so that's that's a good thing but 
Anyways, that's, I think, going to do it for me tonight. I uh, hope you guys enjoyed it. It was, uh, it was fun for me. I'm going to try to do a few more of these, uh, these history style podcasts. I, that, that shit has always interested me. So I might as well share it with you. So I'll try to find some, uh, some interesting stories like this and, and do, do some more, but, um, go find me on uh, social media, Matt McKinley on, you know, on Facebook, uh, at MickerMac85 on Twitter and Instagram show page is burning daylight. You're watching it right now. And, um, you know, at move your ass on Twitter, Instagram, Snapchat. Make sure you uh, you share the stuff if you like it. Um, get the word out to more people. Uh, subscribe to the YouTube channel if you would. I'd appreciate it. And um, thanks, uh, thanks to George and Nick for for supporting the show. Uh, and um, appreciate you all watching. So uh, that's gonna do it for me tonight. So move your ass. We're burning daylight.